chapter 6. And if you don't, I believe Megan has the scripture on the back screen for me this morning, and, and uh, she probably is anticipating and knows at this point that when I preach, I give her a load of, uh, sir, uh, lo load of verses, because I, I tend to like to let the Bible preach for itself, amen? You don't need to hear what I have to say, but I can, if I can show you what God has to say, then we what here we've done and accomplished something this morning. But uh, just so Megan knows, I probably only gave you about a third of the verses I'm going to quote this morning, so I took it easy on you, amen. But the book of Matthew, chapter 6, and, and if you don't have your Bible, it says it'll be on the screen, but this particular passage of scripture, you probably already know. I would venture to say probably everyone in this uh, congregation this morning is very familiar with Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. We refer to it as the Lord's Prayer. And I want to read that this morning as a jumping off point for our text. Matthew 6, beginning with verse 9, says, And after this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Everyone say that with me this morning. Thy kingdom kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to speak to you this morning for a short while. How short, I don't know. Amen. A message entitled, Thy Kingdom Come. And I'll tell you how the emphasis or the, the, the impetus, I guess I should say, for this message began. And, you know, we as Pentecostals, evangelical Pentecostals, we're known, at least we should be, we're known for preaching Jesus. How many of us we should be preaching Jesus? Amen. Amen. That is what we're all about. Now, Jesus is the only way to the Father, the door, the gate, the way, the truth. And the life. But I heard it said a while back, I don't know how long now, maybe a year or so ago, and it resonated with me. The Lord just dropped this, these words that I had heard uh, spoken by a minister uh, in my heart a few weeks ago when I was asked to speak today. And this is what brought this message about. And that was this. This minister said that we Pentecostals, we evangelicals, we preach Jesus and we're pretty good at that. But what we're not very good at and what our pulpits are devoid of, more often than not, is that we don't preach what Jesus preached. And that, that, that just struck a chord with me. I said, yeah, we, we preach Jesus. I try to preach Jesus every chance I get, but wow, I never really stop to think and say, well, what did Jesus preach? Maybe I should be preaching what Jesus <laughs> was preaching. I never stop to think about it. It seems like something that we should know, isn't it? What did Jesus preach? And the answer is has been staring us in the face all of these years. Because there's one thing that Jesus preached more than anything else in his earthly ministry. And that is the kingdom of heaven. In fact, it should come as no surprise because John the Baptist, the one who came to prepare the way for Jesus, when he declared that he's coming, what, what was it that John said? He said, repent, what? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Luke 4 and 43, Jesus himself said, I must preach the kingdom of God. In Luke 8 and 1, the Bible says he did just that. It said that he went to every town, every village, every city, teaching and showing and preaching the glad tidings of the kingdom of heaven. Now, the phrase kingdom of God, and those are interchangeable, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. The, the, the phrase kingdom of God is used at least 70 times in the King James New Testament. The Gospel of Mark uses it at least 15 times, while it's recorded in the book of Luke 33 times. And the synonymous phrase, as I said, the kingdom of heaven is recorded an additional 33 times in the King James Version of the Bible. But interestingly, all 33 three occurrences of kingdom of heaven is found solely in the book of Matthew. And that might seem odd until you realize that the book of Matthew was written with, remember the different gospels were written with different people groups in mind. 
And Mark wrote to the Romans, Luke wrote to the Gentiles, Matthew wrote to the Jews. And there's one thing that Jews uh, are very skittish about, and that is using the name of the Lord. And so instead of kingdom of God, I believe for that reason, Matthew chose to use the phrase kingdom of heaven so that it wouldn't in any way, shape, or form offend the Jews who were uh, so um, picky about the use of the name of the Lord. So how important is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of, of God to Jesus? Well, when he taught us how to pray in our text, right after the very first and foremost thing that you must do, and that is acknowledging the Lordship of our Heavenly Father. The very next words out of his mouth was, Thy kingdom come. Yet hearing this and praying this for centuries, how often do we preach? How often do we teach? When we're at home, do we meditate? Do we witness to people? Do we discuss the one thing that consumed Jesus' three years of instruction more than any other topic? And that is name, the kingdom of heaven. That's what we're going to do today. I want to talk to you about the difference between the kingdom of God and all the other kingdoms that have existed. And then we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. That it has its privileges. How many know that citizenship has privileges that come with it? And then we'll wrap this thing up sometime before two o'clock. Amen. 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 I promise it will be before two. Would you pray with me, Heavenly Father, would you help me today? Lord, this congregation does not need to hear what I have to say. But, Father, they need to hear from you. And I pray, Lord, since I'm the one up here today, that you would anoint me. And, Lord, you would give me your words. Father, I have words on a piece of paper. But I pray this morning that you would put your words in my mouth today. And that you would let us, all of us, including myself, hear from your word. And teach us once again. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, different than all the other kingdoms. Now, we have examples, do we not, of mighty kingdoms throughout the course of human history. Egypt, first one that comes to mind, was an unparalleled kingdom, insomuch that they built wondrous structures, tombs, and pyramids, and temples that still exist, albeit some in a state of disrepair or crumbling, but they still exist today. And if you talk to people, ask people, they will tell you, we don't even know. How they did it. We, their knowledge was so vast, was so incredible, that we can't even today fathom the knowledge and the power of the kingdom of Egypt. But how many know that that kingdom has passed away? And its knowledge passed away along with it. Babylon was a great kingdom. Uh, Daniel declared that Babylon was the chief of kingdoms, the head of gold in his vision. But how many know that Babylon has fallen? Alexander the Great came along soon after, and he built a powerful kingdom. But Alexander died, and his kingdom dissolved into multiple lesser entities. And then Rome, my oh, the kingdom of kingdoms, Rome came along with an iron will and, and might and established a kingdom that lasted in some form or another for over a thousand years. But Rome's iron, as Daniel prophesied, became no longer rules the planet with absolute power. Now, we don't have to go back thousands of years. We can just go back a few uh, decades ago. Here, 80 years or so ago, there was a slogan that was uttered across the world that said, the sun never sets on the British Empire. So great was the expanse of Britannia that uh, it literally did, the British Empire span the entire globe so that the sun never set on land of the British Empire. But today, not only is Britain's empire basically confined solely within the shores of her home, little home island, but increasingly, even that home island is being overrun by foreign hordes coming in and bent upon erasing the treasured culture and heritage of Britain from the face of the earth. See, all of these kingdoms, as great as they were, their might has fallen and has 
kingdoms are no more. But there is a king that currently resides within the hearts of an elect few that is soon to take its place on the world stage. And of its ruler, Isaiah declared that the government will be upon his shoulders. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. There will not be coming a day that the kingdom of God comes to an end. How is the kingdom of God different than any other kingdom? Micah described the coming of the kingdom of God like this. He said, now it shall come to pass, Micah 4 and 1. Uh, it said, now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountain. And shall be exalted above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways. And we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge people, or the judge between many peoples, and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks, and nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Let me tell you today, church, that there is a kingdom coming, and it is a kingdom that is far superior than any that has ever graced the face of the earth. And I don't know about you, but if that kingdom was not coming, I would be a pretty depressed person living in this old world today, when you looking at the state of the world and of her kingdoms. But church, there's a kingdom coming. And that's what Jesus came to tell us. Don't look around at what you see around here. Don't look at the sin and the death and the suffering and the pain and think that, and think that that is all that there is. There is a kingdom coming. And that's why you pray, Father, thy kingdom come. It's been said that it wasn't so much Jesus came to earth trying to get us to heaven, as he came trying to get heaven to come down to earth. But one day, it will do just that. The great poet Ralph Waldo Emerson was once uh, uh, approached by an individual who told him, he said, I just heard, Mr. Emerson, that the, that the world is coming to an end. Someone just told me that. To which the poet replied, he said, well, don't worry about it. We can probably get along just fine without it. And that's how I feel a lot of times, amen, when I look at the state of this whole world. And you want, to, you, you want to shake people. You want to shake, and you want to say, do you realize how you're living? Do you realize how far beneath the, the plan of God you are and realize there's coming a day that we won't have to worry about this whole world anymore? But the world shall be filled with the knowledge of God. The kingdom of God's arrival, church, is the only hope for mankind, and it has been ever since Mankind was created. Even Abraham, going back 4,000 years ago, Abraham wasn't satisfied with the kingdoms of this world. The Bible says that he looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. Those who will be allowed into our Father's kingdom of righteousness must first receive it as a little child, Mark 10 says. They must be doers of his will, Matthew 7, 21. They must keep his commandments, Revelation 22 and 14. They must be willing to seek after it, Luke 12, 31. They must be uh, able to keep up all things, or excuse me, to give up all things in order to possess it. They must love their fellow man, Matthew 25 and 31. They must be willing to suffer and possibly die for its sake, Matthew 5, 10. And most importantly, Jesus himself said in John 3 and 3 that in order to inherit the kingdom of God, you must be born again. And if this sounds like a lot of trouble and a lot of things you have to do, let me tell you this. That finding the kingdom of God is worth the effort and it's worth the time. Jesus likened his kingdom to a treasure that was hidden in a field. And then again, like a pearl of great price. And he said that the meaning was that it was you, you should be willing to sell all, to give up every earthly possession, every mortal desire, every personal comfort in order to obtain the kingdom of God for oneself. Finding entry into this kingdom is worth any cost, any sorrow, and any pain. You realize that Jesus endured the most brutal and humiliating treatment a man has ever endured to pay the price of 
citizenship into this kingdom. And he called himself the door and the way. And he's left word at the gates of woe that whosoever shall call upon his name shall be allowed access. He spent three and a half years telling anyone and everyone who would listen about the glory of the kingdom of God that he has gone to prepare for us. Now, although the kingdom rules the entire universe, it is the ultimate authority. Currently, the kingdom of God is not actively governing the affairs of man. Amen? Amen. Things would be in a lot better shape. But the Almighty is nevertheless ruling in the lives of everyone who have his Holy Spirit. And one day, very soon, he will actively govern all. And he will return to this earth and put an end to evil. Put an end to the kingdom of darkness and establish his kingdom rule from the throne of his father David in Jerusalem. And Revelation 11.15 describes that day. It says, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, no wonder George Frederick Handel, when he wrote that great oratorio, The Messiah, when he looked at those verses of Revelation and said, that said, King of kings and Lord of lords, how they could respond to that was happening. And he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And one of the greatest pieces of art and music ever written was man acknowledging that the kingdom of God is coming. And of that kingdom, there will be no end. And when King George II, the king of the greatest empire on the face of the earth at that time, sat and heard those words, King of kings and Lord of lords, and he shall reign forever and ever. King George didn't get bit out of shape. But where history tells us that King George, who was seated in that opera house, when they said that he shall reign forever and ever, hallelujah, King George stood up in reverence to the King of kings and to the Lord of lords. And his kingdom shall be no end. And the government will be upon his shoulders, church. Hallelujah. Jesus said in Luke 12, 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom of God. I'm, I'm so excited today to be able to preach to you what Jesus preached and to tell anyone like he did who will listen what the kingdom of God is all about. Jesus paid the price for you to enter into the gates of his kingdom. But I would be remiss today if I stopped right there and didn't tell you, since I told you what the kingdom of God is and who gets into the kingdom, and I didn't also tell you what the kingdom of God isn't and who doesn't get in his kingdom. For Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Now this may not be popular, and so if you have any tomatoes, please refrain from throwing them this morning at me as I say this. But how many knows that God will not just let anyone into his kingdom? In fact, I heard it said, and this is what may not be popular, that hell has open borders. But heaven has walls and it has gates. Think about that for a moment. The Apostle Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Neither thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Chapter 15, verse 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot enter, and excuse me, inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Galatians 5 and 19, Paul continues. 
Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, you say that three times, <laughs> idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, and I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things, what? Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Ephesians 5, 5, for this you know. That no whoremonger, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater hath any what? Inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Revelations 21 and 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. No wonder John told us, John the Baptist told the world. Before Jesus came, repent. It's time to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I don't know about you, but I want to be welcome inside the gates of my father's house. Amen. There's a song that J.D. Sumner, the great bass singer, wrote. said, oh, how happy I'll be when life's journey here is run. And I look upon his face and I hear him say, well done. You have fought a faithful fight in my child. You kept the faith. Now enter my joy. Now enter my joys are yours. So just step inside the gate. Inside the gate. Inside the gate of gold, sweet home. No more to cry. No more to die. A crown of life. You've won. You're safe at last. Your sorrows past. A mansion here forevermore. Yes, all of this. I'll hear him say when I step inside the gate. Amen. I'm looking forward to that day that I get to step from this side of heaven inside the gate to that side. Amen. Amen. Why is it important to understand the kingdom of heaven? Jesus gave his disciples the answer to this very question. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 32, he said, Therefore, every scribe, Every person instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Amen. Have you ever been to someone's house that had a lot of cool stuff? And when you came and you're over there for the first time, you're like, let me show you. Let me show you this room that I've got. Let me show you this picture. Let me show you this autograph. Let me show you this memorabilia. And they're excited to tell you and to show you the things that they have. But you know what? Jesus said the person that's instructed, knows about the kingdom of God, has an unfathomable depth of riches that they can bring out. Oh, let me tell you about my father's house. Let me tell you what he's got waiting for you over there. Let me tell you the glory that shall be revealed in my father's kingdom this morning. Amen. And amen. Knowledge of the kingdom is a well that won't run dry. It's a source of riches untold. It is a compass never failing to point the rock towards righteousness, and it is a source of comfort in every trial. Knowledge of the kingdom would seem to include knowing the law of the Lord, would it not? Don't you think if you're going to be a citizen of a kingdom, you should know the rules of the kingdom? Amen. We have every kingdom needs a, what's called the constitution, amen? And we have a constitution in the United States, do we not? It's the rules that we are governed by. And most constitutions have what's called a preamble. Our preamble to our Constitution says, we the people, help me, babe, if I get it wrong, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. We do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. Article 1. No, I'm not going to go. <laughs> That would be impressive, but no, I can't be part of it yet. It has been said that the Constitution, that the kingdom of God has a Constitution as well. And the Constitution of the kingdom of God is found in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. What we commonly refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. That the Sermon on the Mount is the Constitution of the kingdom of God. What it's all about. What is governed by. And that would mean then that the preamble to the constitution of the kingdom of God is what we call the Beatitudes. 
And that preamble happened to be men. It goes something like this. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. You may be here today. You may be downcast. You may be in despair. You may not be knowing which way to turn. But this world is not your kingdom. Our kingdom is the kingdom of heaven. And the preamble to our constitution says, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. For though, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And he even goes on to say a little further, you were promised the kingdom twice in the preamble. Because then it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. What a blessing. The Beatitudes, the preamble of God's constitution, tells us this, that they that mourn shall be comforted, that the meek will inherit the earth, that the hungry and the thirsty shall be filled, that the merciful shall obtain mercy, that the pure in heart shall see God, the peacemakers shall be known as the children of God, and those who are abused, mistreated, and lied about will all receive in God's kingdom a great reward. No wonder Jesus said, Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Where am I on time this morning? Oh, we're running out of it, aren't we? Let me hurry up through this. Second point. It's not as long as the first one, huh? Second point I, I mentioned to you earlier is that citizenship has its privileges. How many realize that? Today, this, even though this world is a mess, for God's kingdom has not taken authority over the affairs of mankind. But waiting in the wings and waiting in our hearts is the good news of the kingdom of heaven, of God's coming. But you know what? You do not have to wait for the kingdom of heaven to rule over you. In fact, you should not wait to become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. So what does citizenship in God's kingdom provide? I'm glad you asked me this morning. I did a little homework. I always like to do things like this. I looked up, as I was thinking about the role of citizenship, I just did a Google search, benefits of citizenship, to see what would pop up. And lo and behold, as if I was reading the various things that came up, that I read that had five main points, five that were seemed to be common among all the different sites that was listing the benefits of citizenship. And here are the top five benefits of citizenship. According to Google, in the kingdom of this world, and you tell me if we have a better, <laughs> better list, amen. Number one, first benefit of citizenship, protection from deportation, <laughs> amen. You think about this, when we step into God's kingdom, when you give your heart and soul over to the Lord, his kingdom shall reign forever and if you're becoming a citizen of a kingdom that's not going to be overthrown it's not going to be destroyed and as long as you remain true and faithful citizen you don't ever have to worry about being deported oh what am i to fear what am i to dread i'm leaning on the everlasting arms of jesus there'll be no sorrow there the song says no more burdens to bear no more sickness no pain and no parting over there forever i will be with the one who died for me. What a day and a glorious day. That will be Daniel chapter 7 and verse 14. Second half of that verse said, And his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away in his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. The second of the five points that was listed is a benefit of citizenship. And I know they mean something else than what I mean, but when I read it, mm. second benefit being a citizen of the kingdom is the promise of family reunification. Oh. Amen. Amen. Now I know what they mean when they say that, but let me tell you what I mean. That second verse of that song I sang a while ago inside the gate says, I will look for mother dear, and I'll look for daddy too. Sisters, brothers will be there. Heaven's joy with them I'll share. Then I'll hear little David play and meet my Jesus on that day. Heaven's joys for me await when I step inside the gate. How many have loved ones that have gone on before? But as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, we're promised the right 
of family reunification. I can see the family gathered, sweet faces, they're all familiar, but no one older people anymore. Oh, this lonesome heart is crying. Guess I'll spread my wings for a flight. This homestead before I'll leave. The third point this morning. Benefits of the kingdom citizenship is the eligibility for government employment. Hey, you can't get a government job unless you're a citizen. How many wants a job in the kingdom of God? How many realize that eternity in the kingdom of God is not spent Sitting on a harp, or sitting on a cloud, strumming a harp. Sitting on a harp might be painful. Of course, there won't be any pain there, so I guess we can do that. But sitting on a cloud and strumming a harp is not what God has envisioned for us in eternity. He has a job for each and every one of us. Scripture tells us that we are being groomed to rule and to reign with Christ as joint heirs of the kingdom, an eternal kingdom, in an eternal universe with an unfathomable and as yet untold number of persons coming out of the millennial reign of Christ on earth that are going to fulfill God's promise to Abraham. That the offspring of Abraham would be as the stars of heaven or as the sand upon the earth. That's a lot of people. And that means there's a lot of activity for the citizens of the kingdom of God. It means there's a lot of oversight. There's a lot of ruling and reigning with Christ that is going to take place. Eternity is busy. It is exciting. And it will be fulfilled. But one thing it won't be in God's kingdom. It will be never born. Amen? Amen. Fourth point. Benefits of citizenship is freedom to travel. Those who reject God in his kingdom are doomed to eternal confinement. But the redeemed of the Lord will not only have unrestricted access to the city of God, and to New Jerusalem and the new earth, but the eternal expanse of a renovated, free from sin universe. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to traveling this universe and to see and the wonders that God has prepared for us. The old song says, Stepping on the clouds and we'll see Jesus rise to meet him in the air. I'm going to leave this world behind, going where the devil cannot find me, going past the moon. The stars and the planets. I'm going to walk on the milky white way. Stepping on the clouds. Amen? Amen. Fifth and final benefit of citizenship is that you have full rights and protection when traveling in a foreign land. Amen. How many knows that as I walk this pilgrim land, there is a friend who walks with me? This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. But how many know sometimes... You get, as a tourist in a foreign land, you might get in trouble, amen? And that's where you want to pull out your passport, and you want to let them know, hey, I'm a citizen of the United States. You can't treat me this way because the full rights and privileges of the citizenship and the rules of my country apply to me when I travel abroad. When you carry an American passport into a foreign land, it means... That should you run into difficulty, the local authorities need to realize that you have the full weight of power and resources of the United States behind you. In fact, Paul even uh, played this card when he was in prison in Jerusalem. They're about to beat him. Before they started to beat him, Paul said, um, is it lawful for you to be a Roman citizen? And then, whoa, wait, I didn't know you were a Roman citizen. Yeah, we, we can't be a Roman citizen unless we stand before the Roman government. And Paul used that citizenship card, if you will, and he played that. But how many knows that in this foreign land that we now dwell, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, if you get into Jesus, he will be your attorney. He will come to your aid. He will post your bell. And he can even send heaven to seal team number six. Or maybe it should be seal team number seven. How about that? The, of angels. To come and secure you in any situation that the ruler of this world may have put you in. Amen? The church is the embassy or the consulate of God's kingdom in this foreign land. And it is a place that we come to celebrate our citizenship in his kingdom. Amen. As I'm wrapping this up, concluding today, I promise this is quick because we can do it. The kingdom of God in heaven is 
misunderstood. Even Jesus' own people, Israel, did not grasp what he meant for those three and a half years when he preached the kingdom. The Jews wanted a kingdom of God. They, they were all for that. But their vision of the kingdom was just simply a, their kingdom free of Roman rule with themselves calling the shots. But they did not realize that first the kingdom of God before all others is a spiritual kingdom that is free from sin before the literal physical manifestation with the people of Israel, the kingdom of God takes place in the very near future. First Corinthians 15, Paul says, then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, and when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. In heaven's constitution, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus repeatedly uttered this phrase. He said, you have heard it said. In other words, he had to constantly tell people, now, things in my kingdom aren't exactly what you've heard about. You've heard it said, but this is really what it's all about. Then, like today, this world has a lot of misconceptions about what the kingdom of heaven is all about. And we don't even hardly talk about it in the church. But God's kingdom was and is and is to come. And it is just as alive today as it was 2,000 years ago in the hearts of all of us who have citizenship in heaven. Now, the kingdom of heaven exists in parallel right now with the kingdoms of this world that are still ruled by power and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. And there is currently a war that is going on. There's always been a war going on between these two kingdoms, the kingdom of man and Satan and the kingdom of God. And actually, that's what kingdoms do, is it not? Kingdoms that exist in close proximity in the same, in the same time and near the same space that have different viewpoints on how one should live and be governed, typically they wind up at war with one another, and there's no exception in this case. But you see, especially in America for the past, in our history, this war has kind of been a subtle war, almost a cold war, war brewing behind the scenes. But how many realize as of lately that cold war has been brewing into a hot war that is becoming increasingly more violent for these clashes of civilization? Are coming to a head. Now God has a purpose in this as well. You see, he is calling this world to choose sides. There is no third kingdom to be a part of. There's the kingdom of darkness and there's the kingdom of heaven. And each and every one must choose which side or which kingdom that you want to be a citizen of. Matthew 25, 31 says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as he, as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And then the king, he knows you can't have a kingdom unless you have a king. The king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. No wonder Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, and seek ye first. This is the central point of the Sermon on the Mount, the constitution of God's kingdom. He said, seek ye first. separation and having to serve the father. All of the things that for you and me he said would be added unto you if you first start with his kingdom. That's what Jesus preached, church. That's what consumed him. That's why he, he said that he came to preach the kingdom of God. And we should do no 